Good evening, everyone. My name is Tom Landy. I direct the Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture here at Holy Cross, and I'm really pleased and really thrilled to welcome such a, a great audience here to Ream Library. One of my capacities also, I coordinate with Professor Alan Avery Peck, who's the Kraft Hyatt Professor of Jewish Studies here at Holy Cross, and with a committee of faculty, our Kraft Hyatt Program in Jewish Christian Understanding, uh, which is co-sponsoring, as I'll mention tonight, this event tonight. Uh, we've been trying to figure out a number of ways to help bring out a good Worcester audience for uh, some co-sponsored events, and this seems like a really spectacular start for us in doing that again. Uh, I'm really grateful, and I'll just simply introduce Nancy Greenberg, of the uh, Worcester Jewish Community Center who is going to introduce uh, our speaker tonight. And I'm just grateful to her and to Emily Holstrom who has helped us put this together. So if it, it, it was her inspiration and start and I'm really grateful to, for that. Thanks. Good evening, I'm Nancy Greenberg. I'm the Cultural Arts Director at the Worcester JCC. The Worcester JCC, the Jewish Federation of Central Mass, Congregation Beth Israel, Temple Emmanuel, and Temple Sinai are delighted to have partnered with the Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture here at Holy Cross for this special event. And we do hope that this is just the first of many such joint ventures. Thank you to Tom Landy, Pat Hinchliffe, and Danielle Kane at Holy Cross for your help in organizing the event tonight. And thank you to the Cultural Arts Committee at the JCC for your guidance and input in planning programs for the community. And thank you to all of our partner agencies in supporting this evening's event. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, James Carroll, please note that we are selling his book and it's at a great rate, so buy one or buy a few. And there will be a book signing and refreshments following his talk. So those will be for sale outside. James Carroll is the author of 10 novels and six works of fiction, including An American Requiem, which won the National Book Award, and the New York Times bestseller, Constantine's Sword, The Church and the Jews, A History now also an acclaimed documentary. His op-ed columns appear weekly in the Boston Globe. He is a distinguished scholar in residence at Suffolk University and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His new book, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, How the Ancient City Ignited Our Modern World, traces how religion and violence have been inextricably linked throughout history and even to this day. Jerusalem is a paradox. It has been central both to passionate idealism and to conflict. Jerusalem is as much a place as it is a set of ideas that has been central to shaping the Western imagination. And with that, please welcome James Carroll. Thank you so much, Nancy Greenberg, for that welcome, and Tom Landy for your welcome as well. And all of you here this evening, I want to acknowledge my debt to the Jewish Community Center of Worcester, which is the main organizer of this event, and I'm very proud to have your welcome to Worcester. And I want to acknowledge uh, the personal pleasure it is for me to be back at Holy Cross, which I think of as a kind of home, really. And as I tell you a bit of my story, you'll perhaps understand why I feel that way. People for a couple of thousand years, maybe more, have been arriving, as this book says in its introduction, at Jerusalem with love in their hearts, the end of the world in their minds, and weapons in their hands. I was one of those pilgrims. And if I didn't have literal weapons in my hands when I arrived in Jerusalem for the first time in 1973 as a young Catholic priest, it was the very eve of the Yom Kippur War, I did arrive with an obsession with weapons that clouded my vision and I'm sure still does. A decade before that, when I was young and I knew so much more than, than I do now, <laughs> I thought that religion and violence were opposites. Religion and violence 
I was the effervescent son of an American Air Force general. I grew up imagining myself in my father's footsteps. We lived at Bowling Air Force Base in the early 1960s. I was a student at Georgetown University where I was majoring in ROTC. <laughs> the academics here especially appreciate the joke of that. <laughs> it was no joke to me. I was dead serious about ROTC. I was uh, dead serious about my identity as a young American patriot whose Catholic faith meshed beautifully with the mission that we felt in those years, standing against Stalinist communism and standing for the great virtues of the American way. And so it felt very natural for me to imagine myself following my dad. But there were other strains that I didn't understand, but that were working very powerfully on me. For example, in high school, we had been stationed in Germany, where I went to an American Air Force-sponsored high school in Wiesbaden, less than 100 miles from what we called the Iron Curtain. Religion, violence, are the two things the same? Imagine this conversation, I remember it vividly, in the cafeteria at the uh, PX, the so-called base exchange at the Wiesbaden Air Base. Wiesbaden Air Base was proud to think of itself as the point of the spear. We were all very aware that there was a massive conventional military that the Soviets had only across the mountains, the Tom's Mountains in the distance, just miles away from us. And rank upon rank upon rank of heavy tanks, many, many thousands of heavily armed soldiers, and conventional force that would overwhelm anything that was in Germany, even including the American Occupation Army. And I remember this afternoon when we got into a heated discussion. It was the spring of uh, the shooting down by the Soviets of Gary Powers' U-2 plane. Those of you too young to remember that, it was an American reconnaissance plane that was shot down over the Soviet Union the President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower, presided over a, a deception, an outright lie, really, that said, insisted for most of a week that the plane was a weather plane off course. And I believed it. And I got into a fierce argument in that cafeteria with a kid who said, it was no weather plane. That plane is a spy plane. And the reason I know it is because my dad his dad was a, an Air Force sergeant, I remember. My dad is the chief mechanic on that plane. The plane took off in Turkey, was flying across the Soviet Union, and it was secretly aimed to land at Wiesbaden Air Base. And there was a whole off-limits corner of Wiesbaden Air Base where the U-2 was based. I was chums with a kid whose father worked on the U-2. He's saying, that was no weather plane. That plane is a spy plane. I said, that can't be. That's the difference between us and them. They lie, we don't. <laughs> and Khrushchev produced Gary Powers a day or two later with the wreckage and his confession. And Washington admitted it was the beginning of making me the man I am today. <laughs> I don't believe anything from anybody. <laughs> Really, it was a defining moment. <coughs> Religion, violence. In that cafeteria, it came up. God, the Soviets just will wipe us out. When they cross that mountain, we're cooked. And, every, and one of the kids said, that's right, that's, that's the point. I, somebody else said, well, I understand why our fathers are here, but what are we doing here with our mothers and our brothers and sisters? And one of the kids said, we're the sacrificial lambs. I said, what? Category out of religion. We're on the altar of sacrifice, he said. When we get killed, the United States of America has no choice but to retaliate. And we're here as proof to the Germans and the French and our NATO allies that the American nuclear umbrella is trustworthy. Thousands of American boys and girls dead. Poof, there goes Moscow. And I'm going, sacrificial lambs. I thought that's what Jesus was. 
beginning the stirring of an imagination that becomes troubled. And the trouble comes to a kind of pitch when a couple of years later, the summer of the Berlin crisis, my job is to go to the Pentagon, we're living at Bowling Air Base by now, and pick up my dad, who's worked late at the Pentagon. I wrote about this in American Requiem, turning point moment in my life. He comes out of the Pentagon about 11 o'clock at night. I know it's not midnight, because the light is still on, shining on the Washington Monument, which in those days used to go out at midnight. He comes out of the Pentagon, he gets in the car. I loved picking him up, a special rare time alone with him. Also, I could drive the Lincoln. <laughs> Usually he would get in the car, I would be in the passenger seat, he would drive. This night he opened the passenger door, he said, slide over, you drive. You know what's going on, he said. He was smoking, he threw the cigarette out the window. When he said that, I knew he didn't have to, he, what he was referring to was the fact that the Soviets had shot down a, another reconnaissance plane, and this time an RB-47, on the border of the Soviet Union a week before. Tensions ratchet, ratcheted up. John Kennedy had gone on television telling us it was time for us to build bomb shelters. It was war over Berlin. Khrushchev had told us to get out of Berlin, and Kennedy was saying we wouldn't get out, and here it comes. And my father says, Mom knows this, you should know it too. One of these nights, I may not come home. If that happens, I'm going to want you to get Mom and the boys in the car, drive across the Potomac, get on Route 1, head south, aim for Richmond, go past Richmond, keep driving, don't stop. Well, I knew, of course, as you do, what he was telling me. He was telling me how afraid he was of the coming Soviet strike on Washington, Ground Zero, the Pentagon. And that was all he said. That was it. I don't remember saying anything, driving home in silence. But I caught from my father, as I understood much later, what I began to think of as the virus of nu nuclear dread, a real feeling for the imminence of the end of the world. A real feeling for what it was to live on the edge of the nuclear abyss. And actually, ladies and gentlemen, I've never left that edge, which makes me a bit of an anachronism in our country now. But it still defines who I am. And my first response to being on that edge, terrified, having been commissioned into that fear by my father's fear, the intimacy of our bond forever, I thought, that he would share that fear with me. It took me in a different direction, no more the Air Force. It was weeks later that in another intimate conversation with him, I said, I think I want to give myself to the things that last, which for an Irish Catholic kid of that era could only mean one thing, which was becoming a priest. I went into the priesthood because of nuclear dread. It sounds weird, doesn't it? I didn't go in for positive reasons. This is probably part of my problem. I won't get psychoanalytic with you, but I went in out of a sense of the imminence of the end of the world. Religion, to me, was the opposite of violence. I went away from violence toward religion, toward what I thought of as peace. Jesus was a man of peace. I knew that. I left Georgetown. I left the the comfort and challenge of that wonderful Jesuit education, what's so vital here to enter the seminary. Curiously, though, it was the seminary of the 1960s, and unexpected things happened to me as to all people of my generation in that decade. Most importantly for me, I had this illusion that violence and religion were opposites punctured. And by the time I was ordained to the priesthood in 1969, two large things had happened to me. One, I had begun to reckon with the shocking and revolutionary for me idea that the Christian world, and in particular the Catholic Church, had grievously failed during World War II, had failed to oppose the genocide of Hitler with anything approaching the 
fierceness with which it should have opposed it. And I also reckoned, because of the fathers of the Catholic Church at the Second Vatican Council, <laughs> they reckoned with the way in which Christian teaching in its very center, the Christ killer charge, and the idea that Jews had been rejected by God, that Christian teaching had prepared the way for Europe's broad cultural failure in the face of Hitler. If it hadn't even prepared the way for Hitler's own lethal anti-Semitism, I had to reckon with that. The difference between religion and violence became less and less. Suddenly I began to get this feeling that religion and violence were, oh my goodness, somehow entangled with one another. And then, of course, as if I needed more reckoning with the Vietnam War, for which my dad had very special responsibility. And the Vietnam War, as I learned to my horror, began as a kind of Catholic campaign against the Buddhists of Vietnam, presided over by the No Dinh Diem family, who were Inquisition-era style Catholics oppressing Buddhists and those Buddhists who immolated themselves in the streets of Saigon, we were told they were communists. They were religious people demanding freedom of religion and the respect of their conscience against an Inquisition-style Catholic regime. Whoa. So I'm ordained into the priesthood at the height of the Vietnam War and Catholic resistance to it. One of the things that first brought me to Holy Cross was to encounter the great Jesuit, Father Daniel Berrigan here, brought here by his friend, Professor David O'Brien, a legendary professor here at Holy Cross. So that by 1973, when I went to Jerusalem as a young Catholic priest, my priesthood, in all honesty, was a mess. Religion, violence, violence, religion, what? And it's not clear to me why I went to Jerusalem. I might have gone to Rome. I might have gone to Ireland. I had an offer of a job at a Navajo reservation in New Mexico. I had an offer of a job at a Catholic, at a, as a Catholic chaplain at Cape Coast University in Ghana. I went to Jerusalem. And the first thing that hit me about Jerusalem was that it was a mess. I went to the Holy Sepulcher. And what did I find in the Holy Sepulcher? Christians in conflict with each other. Franciscans versus Greek Orthodox monks versus Ethiopian Christians, Armenian Christians. So fiercely in conflict with each other that they would come to blows occasionally, fighting over who had control over what corner of the turf, the sacred turf, the resurrection, the site of the crucifixion. It was an astonishment to me. Not to mention then the broader context of the already troubling conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, a traumatized world since 1948, really since the 1930s, since 1917, when the British had set in motion the tension between Arabs and Jews with their fa false promises to both parties. Jerusalem, a mess. And yet, it was precisely in that mess that I experienced, it's hard for me to put it into words, and hello, that just makes me part of the tradition because the tradition has never known how to put this into words. I, had, I experienced what in Jerusalem was first called the oneness of God. And I want to say another word about that. It's, it's another word for monotheism. We know that Jerusalem was the place in which human beings came to the leap of the religious imagination known as monotheism. But the word monotheism doesn't touch what the mystery of this insight is. Monotheism makes it sound like what we're talking about is one God over against all the other gods. Our God is number one. Your gods are weak. Our God's great. That's the way you hear it is often talked about, as if that's what monotheism is. It isn't. Monotheism, in fact, is the wrong word for this. Monotheism is a late, is a, is a, a, a very late word. It's an Enlightenment era word. It first comes into use in the 17th century. No, the word is oneness. Shema Israel, oh, hear, O oh Lord, hear, hear, O oh Israel, the Lord our God is one. The Shahada, the Lord Allah is one. The Creed, I believe in one God. It isn't a number, it's a moral quality. 
I believe in the unity of the cosmos, of all that is in this one. I'm going on about it a bit because this is what I experienced somehow. I felt myself for the first time in a vivid way, one with God. And it was an experience that was partly about understanding God present to the mess of Jerusalem. And what that meant to me, of course, is if God is present to the mess of Jerusalem, God is present to the mess of my life. <laughs> and I could go back home without having fixed the contradictions that defined who I was. And I've been more or less at home with those contradictions ever since, understanding them more as the paradox of my life than the contradiction, because the oneness of God became palpable to me. I want to go further, therefore, with what Jerusalem is. You see, after that, I didn't really know it at first, but when I left the priesthood, in part because I could leave the priesthood without worrying about breaking with God, in part because the oneness of my relationship with God was set, and it's an ironic fact of my life that I left the priesthood, deepened my faith as a Catholic Christian, and have been attached ever since to the project of articulating this vision of who God is for all people. And that is what I love so much about Jerusalem, that I was able to understand what all people had at stake in this place. And therefore, let me try to make it concrete. I'm talking in a way at 10,000 feet. Now let me try to make it concrete to the actual city that I'm talking about and its actual history. I want to give a brief synopsis of the way in which Jerusalem itself came to this experience of the oneness of God and made it available to the human species. That's why I call Jerusalem the place of self-surpassing, the center of affirmation over destruction and of communion over discord. So, you know about the Babylonian assault on Jerusalem. That's, in a way, where I'll let the story begin. The story goes back well before that, but let's begin there because my point is made vivid there. So in the 6th century BCE, the Babylonians, the most powerful empire in the world, Babylon was a fantastic city, probably the biggest city in the world, population maybe 200,000 people. It had paved streets, it had sewage systems, it had markets, it had sanitation, it had good and, uh, and clean and reliable water. It was a wonder. It was, it's gone. It was about 50 miles south of where Baghdad is today. There are mounds in the dirt that are all that's left. But anyway, the Babylonians come to Jerusalem, capture the people who live there, destroy their city, especially destroy their temple, the Temple of Solomon, and take the elite away to Babylon. You've, you know this, the exile. What's going on here? The exile was intended to destroy the, uh, the identity of this people, and it should have. It was a kind of version of what we would call ethnic cleansing. And they should never have remembered who they were. This is how you got rid of enemies. You took their place and you took them away from it. And within a generation, they'd forget their place and they'd be assimilated into you and your power structure and your belief system. This people in Babylon didn't do that. Instead, they cast their eye back to Jerusalem. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we thought of you, O Zion. And the other thing they did was they found it impossible to do what was expected of them, which was to give obeisance or to honor in any way the mundane range, the large range of gods, of deities that presided over every aspect of life. When you went to the bathroom, you honored a god. When you copulated, you honored a god. When you ate, you honored a god. When you got up in the morning, you honored a god. This people didn't do it. At first, because they were monolaters, 
They only worshiped one God. That's how they thought of themselves. They took no position on the other gods. But in looking back at Jerusalem, they came to a new insight about the God they worshiped, which was, this is God, period. This is the only one. Without getting into denigrating these other gods, our God is the one God. And what that meant to them was it was, not, it was unthinkable that they should honor any other God. When they were released from captivity, when the fortunes of the Babylonian Empire fell, this people did the unthinkable, which was they went right back to Jerusalem and they began to rebuild it. And the first thing they rebuilt was their temple. Only now it was different because the Holy of Holies of the temple used to hold the Ark of the Covenant. No one's really sure what that was. Perhaps it was some kind of relic of the tablets of Moses. No one's really clear, but it was sacred to this people. And the Ark of the Covenant defined the center of their religious identity in the Holy of Holies. But when they come back, the Ark of the Covenant is gone. Nevertheless, they constructed the Holy of Holies. And they were faced then with the question, what to put in the Holy of Holies? And guess what they put into it? I know you know. But I'm drawing attention to this because it's, it represents an amazing leap in the religious imagination. The Holy of Holies, from the time of the return from Babylon forward, was vacant. There was nothing in it. The high priest alone could go into the Holy of Holies once a year, Yom Kippur. And what the Holy of Holies held was nothing, which was the most eloquent thing it could hold, because what's being said about this God? This God cannot be represented. This God is present to the people in its absence. This God is a God about whom we can only know one thing, which is we can't know anything about this God, which is a kind of knowledge. Are you with me here? <laughs> this is a paradox of the religious imagination, but it's central. And it set loose this magnificent breakthrough. They stopped being monolaters and became monotheists. There is one God who is not just to us the tribe or to us the nation, or to us, the people Israel, there is one God who is to the cosmos. All that is. Which is why it was only then that they began to arrange their texts, their oral traditions, their songs, their psalms, their memories, their tales. They began to organize what they had that, I, that defined them as a people into what we call the Bible. And it was now in the 6th century BCE, that the Bible begins to be a defining element of this people. And what's the first thing they say about God in the Bible? The creation myth of Genesis is unique because it's not the creation myth of the tribe. It's the creation myth of the cosmos, the creator of all that is. and. The creator of all that is in creating human beings identifies human beings as the image of the creator, which is the breakthrough. That is to say, the oneness of God extends to each person. We are all one with God. This breakthrough in the human imagination means so much more than we usually think it does, because it means not only that God is one, it also means that we are one with God. There is a principle in the being of the cosmos in which God is present, and we have access to it. And guess where this insight comes alive? It's Jerusalem. And if you had had that experience in Jerusalem, you wouldn't forget it either. And these people, from then on, are Jerusalem people, no matter what. From then on. And let me just say, in parenthesis, this insight ripples down through history, past the Enlightenment, into the secular age, into the time when people reject religion 
reject monotheism in the name of human rights and in the name of the personal dignity of people who don't need to be oppressed by religion anymore. Guess what? Human rights, the idea of human rights, which is basically that every person is sacred, begins with the insight about God, who is present in every human person. The beginning of the universal declaration of human rights, which yes, yes does, thank God, come to us in a kind of anti-religious revolution, because by then religion had become accreted and, and obscuring its most important meanings. But nevertheless, it begins in this biblical vision. And it's now that people begin to understand that this God is also special because this God does not identify with the powers of the world. This God identifies with the victims of power. And so when they arrange their stories around their own history, they emphasize the way in which God identifies with them when they are victimized by power, which is, the, of course, the masterpiece of that is the Exodus story, when God is identifying with those who've been cast out, not with those, the powers who remain. So something basic happens, and it's Jerusalem. And I'm telling you, this is the basis of Jerusalem's identity as the city of self-surpassing. And so, of course, when Jesus comes into his life in the Jewish milieu, he comes entirely as a Jew, and it's into this profound Jewish insight that he comes. What is it about Jesus that people find attractive? He embodies in his life, for those who recognize it in him, a dramatic and undeniable experience of the oneness of God. And when you read the story of Jesus, it takes him by surprise too. He goes to St. John the Baptist as an act of repentance, like everybody else who went to John the Baptist, according to the gospel. But with, confronted with the John the Baptist, he has a vision of God who basically says, you are my beloved one. You are my beloved son. And from then on, he has this sense of oneness with the one God, which defines him then, and that defines his preaching. And everywhere Jesus goes, what he is preaching is the Jewish message of the oneness of God, Shema. That's what Jesus is preaching. And of course, in that context, it has political resonance because the one thing an empire needs of oppressed people is the opposite of oneness. Empires need people to be in discord with one another. So to preach unity, oneness, becomes a politically dangerous act, which is why, and Jesus sees it. John the Baptist is executed. Jesus sees what's coming. Of course, his story has to take him to Jerusalem for a reckoning with not the Jewish establishment, as the Christian memory will have it, but with Rome, who can't stand the possibility that this oppressed people would claim a fresh kind of, well, what's the word for it? We have a word for it in our contemporary politics, solidarity. What defeated the Soviet Union? Not my father's B-52s. It was solidarity, the power of oneness. So Babylon is the beginning of the story. Jesus comes into the story out of the Jewish resistance to the violence of Rome comes the decidedly Jewish vision of Jesus of Nazareth. And his oneness with God is what his followers recognized, ultimately making them think, believe, that he was the Christ, the one to come, the one who was to come, the one who was to come doing what? Making vivid and undeniable the fundamental Jewish identity, which is tied up entirely with Shema, the oneness of God. And this oneness for Jesus, which is what we would call a radical vision of peace, reflected in his radical nonviolence, we don't know much historically for certain about the Jesus of history. But we do know from all the sources we have that he was a person of nonviolence. 
which is, of course, essential to what appealed to that young, messed up son of a soldier priest in that time. A man of nonviolence whose resistance to Rome, like Jewish resistance to Babylon, ended the only way it could end, because they did to him what empires always do to people who preach solidarity in the face of imperial dominance. They killed him. The story, of course, doesn't end there. The story of Jesus and his death might have come to us very differently, except for something that happened in Jerusalem then. It was the exacerbation, the escalation, the making absolute of Roman imperial violence against the Jewish people. So Jesus is put to death by the Romans in the year 30 as a Jewish resistor. We know that because he died the way Jewish resistors died, by crucifixion. In the Christian memory, alas, Jesus is remembered as crucified as if that was an unusual form of death. Yes, the good thief, the bad thief, they were put on the cross. I remember as a boy being told that, well, they, were, they just had their hands tied with ropes. Only Jesus had the torture of nails. The Christian imagination needed to think that Jesus' suffering was extreme, was somehow infinite, for theological reasons not to go into now. But the truth of the matter is that Jesus' suffering wasn't extreme, it was mundane. Thousands of Jews were put to death like that even if they're gone from the Christian memory. And that story of his death in 30 began to evolve over, over the decades. Remember that the first followers of Jesus, and, and, and all we know about them for sure, Josephus puts it beautifully. He said, there were those who could not let go of their affection for him. And over the years, they told stories about him. And they told stories about what his preaching had been, what he meant to them, what they saw in him, and they elaborated the stories, and the oral traditions began to be written down, and ultimately they took form, finally, of what we know the Gospels. I know you know this, but let me remind you. The earliest Gospel is not written until 70. The latest Gospel, John, so that's Mark. Matthew and Luke are written in the 80s into the 90s. And the Gospel of John is written in 100. So what's happening between 70 and 100? The savage Roman war against the Jews. The century-old occupation of Palestine by the Romans has come to a violent head when the Romans have finally had it with this tradition of Jewish resistance. Why were the Jews resisting? They were resisting because it wasn't just an occupied people hating an occupying power. It was because the land itself was the sign of God's covenant with this people. So the land was holy. The occupation by Romans was a blasphemy, a sacrilege. If you were a believing Jew, you had to oppose it. Well, uh, you might, if you're a member of the establishment, look for ways to accommodate the, uh, the brutal Roman overlord. So there might have been accommodation from the temple priesthood. Yes, that's part of the story, too. There were conservatives who tried to make the best deal they could. We might call them collaborators, even. But their intentions were good, probably. They wanted to spare the people. And then there was, at the other end, radicals who would have no truck with the Roman Empire. And therefore, if the temple priesthood was collaborating, they would be critical of the temple priesthood, too. We know this from the Dead Sea Scrolls a group of radical Jews in the desert who had this attitude toward the temple priesthood. Jesus was somewhere on that spectrum, opposed to Rome, not violent. There were violent people. And all of that violent resistance built up until by 70 the Romans said no more. And so what did they do? They destroyed the temple. They laid waste Jerusalem. And they gave a profound religious crisis of identity to every Jew. What is it to be a Jew without the temple? Which is the center of Jewish religious imagination, as we've seen, even with the vacancy of the Holy of Holies. And what is it to be a Jew without the temple? Beginning in 70. And you see this question being asked even in the Gospels, because the Christian answer to that question is, 
And when I say Christian, I mean those Jews who follow Jesus. Their answer to the question is, Jesus is the new temple. And that's how the Gospels define him. We don't need the old temple. In fact, the old temple was destroyed because the other Jews over there refused to recognize our claims for Jesus. So how do we know that what we're saying about Jesus is true? Because the temple is destroyed. Hello? Look. That wasn't the Romans that did that. God did that. That's what one answer was. What was the other answer? The other answer was now we have an imagined temple. It was a version of that leap made in Babylon. We have an imagined temple, which is defined by study of Torah and observance of the law. Shabbat, the imagined temple in time, as Rabbi Heschel called Shabbat. And from now on, we look to Jerusalem, we remember Jerusalem, but we're not there. And we believe that God comes with us into exile from Jerusalem. But we are still Jerusalem people. And those two responses set in motion the rivalry between these two heirs to the people Israel. And in good imperial fashion, didn't the Romans make sure that that rivalry was lethal? So over those decades of the Gospels composition from 70 to 100, you can read the Gospels step by step in chronology and what happens, the argument between two groups of Jews the Jews who accepted Jesus and the Jews who didn't, becomes fiercer and fiercer. So that by the time you get to the Gospel of John, you get the Jews totally identified with Satan. Jesus in the Gospel of John is remembered as calling the Jews the children of Satan, a cosmic demonizing of the Jewish people. Why? Because Jesus said that or thought that? Of course not. Jesus was a Jew. Only a Jew. Permanently, fully, completely a Jew. I thought he was an Irish Catholic. <laughs> Christians think he's a Christian. <laughs> Many people. I, I remember on CNN when the Jewish Carmelite nun, Edith Stein, was made a saint of the church. One of the CNN anchors, a woman, maybe, you know, like Diane Sawyer or someone like that, said, Edith Stein is the first Jewish saint of the Catholic Church. I remember thinking, there's something wrong with that. <laughs> when Yasser Arafat greeted Pope John Paul, Yasser Arafat said, I, I come from Palestine, the home of St. Peter, the Palestinian. <laughs> and there's a way, of course, in which, geographically speaking, St. Peter was a Palestinian. One understands what Yasser Arafat was doing. But one longs to have heard the response be, well, but if you had asked St. Peter, he would have said only, I am a Jew. And we know the story of what followed from this rivalry, exacerbated by Rome, and then made permanent when you know the story, the end of the Roman war against the Jewish people in 135, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem totally, laid it waste, and changed its name, and from then on forbid Jews ever to be there again, including the Jews who follow Jesus. So the center of the Christian movement that was Jewish understanding Jesus' Jewishness and understanding the polemical argument between the Jesus people and the rabbinic people that the Jews who are blasted in the Gospels, don't, it doesn't mean the Jews. It means those Jews over there who don't believe what we Jews over here believe. That's what the Jews meant to the people who wrote it, since they were Jews. But when the Jewish center of Christian belief is gone, with all belief in Jerusalem, the Christian movement becomes dominated by Gentiles who have no idea of these Jewish origins of the movement and who have no real idea that Jesus was a Jew. And that begins the lethal, terrible 
consequence that is so well known. It didn't begin because the Jesus people were venal. It began because they were human beings pressed by Rome. They were, it was impossible for them to tell their story with Jesus opposed to Rome because they would have been snuffed out if they had. So they told the story as if Jesus was opposed to the Jews. And they told the story as if God was the one who destroyed the temple and who sent the Jewish people into exile from Jerusalem. And so very quickly, Christian theology needed, number one, a permanently denigrated temple, and number two, Jewish people permanently in exile from the Jewish homeland. And that defines the coming centuries. But it's still Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is a wasteland. Look what, I'm de look what I'm describing. A center of peace and nonviolence and reconciliation, constantly getting sucked back into the human condition of war and conflict. Both things. I began by talking about paradox, and by now the paradox is established. Jerusalem is the breakthrough to the peaceful imagination in the oneness of God. And it is also the place where the human condition constantly reasserts itself. Why? Because Jerusalem, from the Babylonian conquest forward, is the cockpit of violence. Empire after empire wrecks its worst in Jerusalem. When Constantine becomes a Christian, he valorizes the new ideology of the Christian empire with which he's going to unify this vast stretch of territory with hundreds of different tribes, pagans most of them, from northern Germany all the way to the far southeastern coast of the Mediterranean. How is he going to do it? With the image of the cross discovered where? In Jerusalem. And he, he's the one who returns to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem now becomes the center of the memory of the Christian triumph over the Jewish people. Because the cross was hidden by the Jewish people. And when the cross was discovered, the Jewish people were finally overcome, finally defeated. And their defeat is permanent because they can't be in Jerusalem, which becomes theologically reified by St. Augustine in the early fifth century. And so Christians are now doing what the Jews did after Babylon. They've returned to Jerusalem. They've built their temple. In their case, it's the Holy Sepulcher. And they have used it as the pillar of their religious imagination. Not Rome. Not Rome. Constantine's not particularly interested in Rome. Jerusalem. The biggest church in the Christian world is the Holy Sepulcher. And Christians identify themselves with Jerusalem. Hello, somebody else got a feel for the oneness of God. A merchant, maybe illiterate, a merchant in Arabia, instructed by Jews in the neighborhood and by some Christians. Remember, Jews have been driven out. A lot of Jews have taken refuge in Arabia. Christians have been driven out too, Christian heretics living in Arabia. Muhammad encounters these people. He gets a feel for what they believe and what their tradition is. And it draws him in. And somehow, we don't know how, this man has the revelation of the oneness of God. That's how he puts it. And what is his first response to it? He defines himself by turning toward Jerusalem to pray. And he invites his followers to turn toward Jerusalem to pray, which they do. And they do that until in the tribal conflicts in the Arabian Peninsula, Jewish tribes associate with his enemies. This isn't about religion now. This is about tribal alliances. It's, it's more accidental than is usually understood. And because Jewish tribes associate with his enemy, he orders the facing of Mecca as the place toward which we pray. Nevertheless, within five years of the prophet's death in the seventh century, Guess where his armies go first? Jerusalem. Umar, the caliph, leads an army to Jerusalem. And he surrounds it, and he sends in a message to the Greek Byzantine patriarch and says, we want Jerusalem, but we won't kill you for it. We'll wait. And eventually, the Byzantines open the gates, 
and Umar and his army comes into Jerusalem, that's the Islamic conquest of Jerusalem, done without bloodshed, no one killed. And the reason Umar is there is because he wants to see the rock where Abraham had brought Isaac for sacrifice. He wants to see the rock that had been below the Holy of Holies of the Temple of Solomon. He wants to see the place, that is, where the Jews had experienced the oneness of God, which he has experienced. And he is shown the town garbage dump and says, what is this? And Umar hears the story of how Christians see in the denigration of the temple remnant proof of Christian claims. And he orders it cleaned up. He orders it honored. And he orders, for the first time, Jews back into Jerusalem and invites them to return to the Temple Mount. The Islamic arrival in Jerusalem, that is, is an arrival honoring the Jewish origins, the Jewish ingenious leap of the religious imagination. Jerusalem, a place of self-surpassing, of reconciliation. Islam's first experience of itself in Jerusalem is as a, a, a collective of reconciliation. And that takes form. And as you know, the Temple Mount called the Noble Sanctuary is honored. And within a century, two magnificent structures are built there. The Dome of the Rock, which is not a mosque. It's not a mosque. It was in its original erection, an honoring of the ultimate place where the oneness of God was first experienced. And it was not a mosque. The mosque was at the far end of the, plat of the plateau. As we know, years go by and there becomes a kind of exclusive claim to this territory. But it didn't begin that way, and that's urgently important. But the point for us as children of Western civilization is Christians experienced themselves as having lost Jerusalem. And guess what they did? They did what Jews had done. They identified themselves by Jerusalem. Still, Jews are praying or proclaiming next year in Jerusalem. And Christians effectively began to do that too. So that, although with a difference, so the 7th century, 8th century, 9th century, 10th century, 11th century, Europe finally has military power. And what are they going to do with it? The popes are looking for something to get the European barons and princes to stop warring with each other. He, he conjures this great idea, which is we can stop having warfare inside Europe if we can generate warfare outside Europe. And the obvious enemy is Islam. And the pope calls a crusade, not the one you're thinking of, a crusade for Constantinople to throw back the armies of Islam threatening the Greek Byzantine capital. And guess what the European response is? A, a big yawn. Nobody goes. This is in the middle of the 11th century. In 1180 or so, I mean, sorry, in 1080 or so, so a little later in the 11th century, the pope calls another crusade for Iberia. Let's rescue what we call Spain from Muslims. Guess what the European response is? A yawn. Nobody goes. 1096, the pope calls famously the crusade for Jerusalem. God wills it. And what happens? The equivalent of a million people, in our terms, drop everything and join the crusade and set off immediately for the Holy Land in the spring of 1097. Sorry, the spring of 1096. The pope calls the crusade in October of 1095. And in the spring of 1096, headed for the enemy outside, what of course they do is attack the enemy inside, which is the Jewish settlements along the Rhine the high culture peak of Jewish civilization in Europe. Beautiful cities up and down the Rhine that are savaged by the Crusaders, and thousands of Jews are murdered within a few weeks in that spring. You know that story. The first authentic pogrom, really. On the way to Jerusalem, 
And when the Crusaders get to Jerusalem in 1099, it's not like Umar. It is a slaughter. Everyone killed. Every Jew, every Muslim in the city killed by the Crusaders. The Crusaders hold Jerusalem for less than a century. Saladin takes it back, the great legend of Saladin against King Richard the Lionheart. And the European Christians are thrown back once more, and they lose Jerusalem. And guess what they do? They, they do what the Jews did. They never take their eyes off Jerusalem. They un identify themselves by longing for Jerusalem. This is lost to most of our memories. The Crusades, for almost 300 years, again and again and again, attempt to take back Jerusalem, and they fail. But in those 300 years, Europe comes into a sense of itself. It becomes Europe, in fact, in those 300 years. And this is so much a defining note that when Christopher Columbus set sail to the West in 1492, guess where he was going? It wasn't the Indies. I mean, yes, the Indies were what he expected. And it wasn't just for riches. Yes, riches were what he wanted. But when you read his chronicles, and as he reported to the king and queen, he was going to Jerusalem to take Jerusalem back in a route that would bypass Islamic control. Is it any wonder that Jerusalem defines the movement of the people who barely, a little more than a century later, arrive in New England, 1630? And what is it that John Winthrop says they're doing? They've come here to create a city on a hill, which is a line from Jesus, of course, but it's a reference to Jerusalem. We know that because the town they settled in then, not Boston, despite what people in Boston think, <laughs> was Salem, which is another name for Jerusalem. And when the dissenters in Salem left because the place wasn't pure enough to be Jerusalem, they started a new place having crossed the border of what we think of as New Hampshire. And they started their town, which they called Salem. Why is there a Salem, New Hampshire, so close to a Salem, Massachusetts? Because it was Jerusalem. Jerusalem lives an inch below the surface of the Western and the American imagination. Jerusalem is like a thermal current. It's like the Gulf Stream below the Atlantic Ocean. It's the hot water underneath Western civilization. And every once in a while, it surfaces. Do you know what the most common place name in the United States of America is? If you count up all the Zions and all the Salems and all the Jerusalems, it's Jerusalem. No wonder this city drew me. And it, look what it is. It is a city constantly struggling to find ways out of violence and to be worthy of that great leap out of violence that the people made in the very beginning. I've been giving you a kind of positive spin on this history. I know that there's another side to the story. The Bible's violence, yes, there is violence in the Bible. Monotheism can be the ground of triumphalistic superiority. Jerusalem is the place where the Jesus people demonized the Jews, where Constantine turned the empire into a militant church, and where crusader mayhem sanctified pogroms, and where an apocalyptic millennial fan fantasy of the end time gripped the Christian imagination especially. And Jerusalem emerged in the modern times as command central of fundamentalism in all three traditions. Auschwitz was a revelation of where all of that dark history led. And something else happened at the time of Auschwitz, which was Hiroshima, which is a revelation of where such dark history will lead if it isn't changed. So what we have here is a double vision, the current of positive energy that flows from Jerusalem, and the fact that that energy can become radioactive. So where does that leave us, actually? Well, this line from Jerusalem 
I set before you life and death, therefore choose life. That's where it leaves us. Jerusalem does the setting. Jerusalem puts the choice, and it puts the choice to us today, here, in this room. Choosing life, that is what we have. And thinking of Jerusalem, let's remember, let's emphasize that here is where God checked Abraham's knife, saying no to God-willed killing. And here is where religion was limited by ethics, and where sacrifice was limited by love, and where God told the people that what God wants is compassion and regard for the neighbor. And here is where, with the one God's image found in every person, the idea of human rights was born. And here, where God is found siding with the victims instead of with the wielders of power, the seed of democracy was planted. And here, the vacant temple is where all claims to have God on our side against those others, to have God at the head of an army, are discredited. Here is where violence has been directly confronted. Yes, there is violence in the Bible. Of course there is. And yes, there is violence in the story of Jesus. Of course there is. Because violence is the subject. Violence is the problem that this whole long tradition is responding to and saying no to. The human species, and here if you disagree, we have a big debate. The human species did not come all this way to bring about its own extinction. And that's what the choice is for us now, after Auschwitz and after Hiroshima. And it is a matter of human choice. Jerusalem puts that choice more eloquently than any place in history or than any other place on the planet. The most glorious face of humankind or the bloodiest. Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Thank you. Sure, of course.